privilege to introduce today's debate event between MIT and Maine DOC. And I'd like to acknowledge my partners who made this historic event possible. Professor John Katsoulis and Adam Lee of Boston College's Fulton Debating Society. Dr. Lee Perlman, the co-director of the Educational Justice Institute at MIT. Alliance's Ved Price and Lauren Reed for hosting us at this conference. My own MPDL teammates, who've also helped me organize this event and have been instrumental in its success, Brittany Lamar, Brooke Lacchiato, and Natasha Haverty. And a very special thanks are obviously in order for Maine's Department of Corrections, especially Deputy Commissioner Dr. Ryan Thornell and Administrators Anna Black, Trisha Flanders, and Philip Patoko in particular. They've been leaders in what they're doing in, in Maine in a progressive way, and it's actually been a privilege to work with them as well. And you're all about to witness a remarkable display of both intellectual ability and social diplomacy in action. And while both of these amazing debate teams will make their respective cases today, we're pretty sure that the case for educational equality will speak for itself. Resolved, the United States should adopt constitutional amendment to require term limits for justices of the Supreme Court. MIT will argue in the affirmative supporting this resolution, while Maine DOC argues in the negative, position refuting the affirmative case. We have five very distinguished judges who will be scoring the teams on their analysis, reasoning, evidence, organization, refutation, and delivery. Serving as chief judge is Jared Atchison, director of debate at Wake Forest University, director of graduate studies, and president of the American Forensic Association. Rounding out the panel are Dale Herbeck, professor of communication at Northeastern University, former director of debate at Boston College, and former editor of Argumentation and Advocacy. Michaela Molson, director of debate at Emory University and coach of the top speaker at the 2022 National Debate Tournament. Ed Lee III, senior director of the Alvin W. Barkley Forum for Debate, Deliberation, and Dialogue, and also a three-time recipient of the James Unger Award given to the coach of the best debate team in the country. And finally, Sherry Hall, Administrative Director of Harvard University's Debate Council and National Debate Tournament, Board of Trustees member and treasurer. As today's moderator, I will introduce our debaters individually and they will adhere to their specified time limits. A digital timer will be displayed on screen and speakers' microphones will be muted if they exceed their maximum time limits. At the conclusion of the debate, our judges will tally up each team's cumulative point totals to determine the winner of today's contest. So let us begin the debate. Up first, presenting the affirmative team's first constructive argument for seven to nine minutes, hailing from Split Croatia, please welcome MIT's Lukai. Hold one second for timer. My Screen is freezing. Ved, can you take people off the spotlights? I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone. Okay, for some reason that worked, so we can get started. I apologize. No problem. So, we will restart. Our first speaker preventing the, the affirmative team's first constructive argument for seven to nine minutes, hailing from Split Croatia. Please give a warm welcome to MIT's Lou Kai. Hi, and we would first like just to thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this historic event. So the current Supreme Court has become politicized and unpopular. It's true it's unrepresentative of the will of the people and predictably split between liberal and conservative justices. Its confirmation process a partisan spectacle. We believe the U.S. should adopt a constitutional amendment to require term limits for justices of the Supreme Court in order to mitigate all of these issues. First, we would like to clarify that while we will not be arguing for a specific term limits plan because they differ in minute details and we don't want this debate to get bogged in those details, we agree with, but we agree with all of the plans that the term limits would last 18 years and nominations would be staggered every two years. 
Next, we'd like to provide the following framework for evaluating this debate. The U.S. ought to choose the policy in today's debate that results in a government that is more representative of the will of the people. This is because, as a democracy, we support governance on behalf of the people and believe in people's rights. To, say, to have a say in how their society functions. Thus, we should be framing our government to the best of all these values. We also, as a republic, support a government where policymakers, by definition, are elected by their constituents to best represent their interests. The right for policymakers to make these decisions, therefore, is given by the people and is based on the promise that they are to make decisions with their interest in mind. Uh, that, thus, we should be framing our government to the best of all these promise. Now we will be presenting the problems that plague our current world due to the structure of the Supreme Court. To begin, it's important to establish just how influential each Supreme Court justice is. Firstly, once they get appointed, there's very little that can be done to remove them. The only mechanism we currently have is impeachment, but as Natelson writes in 2019, it has never been used successfully to remove a Supreme Court justice. Thus, justices essentially stay on the court until they either ret retire or pass away. Additionally, due to higher life expectancies and lower workloads, they are serving longer and longer terms. As Ginsburg writes in 2021, that the average Supreme Court justice tenure went from 15 years before 1970 to 25 years after 1970. This increased average tenure also greatly lowers the frequency of new appointments because vacancies become rarer. This is corroborated by Lane, who in 2019 estimated that there will only be 25 new Supreme Court appointments over the next century, compared with 47 in the previous 100 years and 60 between 1869 and 1969. The ramifications are clear. As a result of longer terms, each justice that gets appointed to the Supreme Court uh, has an inordinate amount of long-term influence over, uh, with their rulings, and as a result of less frequent appointments, the makeup of the Supreme Court becomes more rigid over time. Thus, a single appointment can lock in the majority in the court for a very long time. Why is this a problem? The heightened value of each individual Supreme Court seat contributes to one of the largest problems with the structure of the Supreme Court, partisan politics and polarization. We will now discuss two ways in which the current structure of the Supreme Court heightens partisanship and pol polarization well before each justice even takes their seat at the Supreme Court, encouraging strategic blocking and politicizing the nomination process. And in the second constructive speech, we will address strategic retirements and out of touch justices. First, let's consider strategic blocking. Due to the natural partisanship within the Senate, the ruling party in the Senate has an incentive to try to exert as much influence on the government as possible. One particular avenue that they can take is through the Supreme Court. In particular, due to high political value of a given Supreme Court seat, the Senate has an incentive to maximize the chances of picking a justice that reflects the interests of the ruling party. They can do this by blocking any nominations made by a president if they are of an opposing party, so as to prevent the opposing party from gaining a favorable justice. This phenomenon was exhibited in 2016 when the Republican majority in the Senate blocked President Obama's nominees, uh, nominee during the last year of his term. Blocking such a nomination is controversial and takes a large amount of political capital, but because each seat is so valuable, as we have explained, this is typically worth it. This is corroborated by Calabresi, uh, who as early as 2006, wrote that it is widely assumed that any Supreme Court seat that opens up in a presidential election year will be unfillable because of the filibuster threats. The main harm is that this creates inequitable appointments relative to popular opinion by skewing the nominations toward the, toward the party that's willing to game the system in this way. Uh, for example, Simon writes in 2020 that Democrats have only appointed four of the past 18 justices, even though they were in power as long as Republicans. Republicans. This results in a clear skew of power in one direction or the other, despite the public sentiment being reflective of a 50-50 split, making the court less representative of the will of the people. And their plan of 18-year term limits reduced this incentive by reducing the perceived strategic value of a given Supreme Court justice. In 2006, Calabres and Lindgren state that an 18-year uh, term limits would cap the influence over decision-making. Uh, the frequency at which nominations occur increases, which provides more opportunities for the makeup of the court to change. Thus, the influence that one seat has on the overall dynamics of the court uh, becomes short-lived. Like Knight writes in 2018, in our world, we reduced inclination to use up this political capital on blocking a Supreme Court nominations. Nominations would also occur more frequently, so strategic blocks, if they were to happen, would drain political capital really quickly. And once an arm of every president getting to confirm two justices is created, created, it will become uh, even costlier to block a nomination without a good reason. 
This results in a higher share of justices that were nominated and confirmed by the president and the Senate majority from different parties. These justices are therefore more likely to be more moderate, resulting in a less polarized Supreme Court, which is more representative of the American electorate being a more of 50-50 even split. Secondly, let's consider the politicization of the nomination process. Currently, there is a perverse incentive for the Supreme Court nominations to be treated as political battles between Democrats and Republicans, rather than normal functions of government. This is because the large influence that each prospective justice would have on the court gives the nomination process great political value, and the infrequency at which they occur turns the whole process into a, part, into a political spectacle. As Costello writes in 2020, since no one knows when another vacancy in the court will open, presidents and senators feel a great deal of pressure to treat vacancies as important polit political battles. This material, uh, materializes on both sides of the nomination process. The sitting president is encouraged to nominate a candidate based on their likelihood to score a pursued win for their political party, resulting in more partisan nominations. Similarly, senators are discouraged from working across the political aisle and making decisions based on their individual beliefs on the competency of a given nominee. And they're instead pressured to side entirely with their political party and focus on the nominee's ideological leanings. This has two unique harms. Firstly, since there is a lot less focus of, uh, on the quality of the candidates being considered, the nominees that do get considered end up being less qualified than average. Lower quality justices serving on the court ultimately erodes the integrity and functionality of the court itself. And secondly, since each political party wants to garner a political win, the nominees that do get considered in the past ultimately end up being more polarized in one direction or the other, just driving the makeup of the court further away from the center and the extension further from the sentiments of the average voter. Through term limits, we decrease political spectacle. Increased frequency and regularity of appointments mean that each individual nomination process becomes normalized rather than politicized, and the lower value of each individual seat gives less incentive to politicize them. In our world, candidates are more qualified and less polarized. When the nomination process is less politicized, that allows for a greater amount um, a focus to be placed on the quality of candidates and less on their ideological leanings. This also makes the court more representative of the people. Less politicization means candidates being discussed are closer to the middle than to the far extremes, which is closer to the beliefs of the medium voter. Under a non-politicized nomination process, moderate senators are more likely to voice their genuine beliefs in a given nominee, but under a politicized nomination process, they're incentivized to decide entirely with their party for the sake of getting a political win. As Orenstein in 2014 puts it, it would to some degree lower the temperature on confirmation battles by making the states a bit lower. In conclusion, by decreasing the value of each individual nomination, our side de-escalates the polarized confirmation battles, ending the partisan arm, partisan arms race, and resulting in Supreme Court justices who are more qualified, more bipartisan, and more representative of the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Lukai. Now up, offering cross-examination for the negative team for two minutes from Knox County, Maine. Please give a warm welcome to Maine DOC's co-captain, Victoria Scott. Thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions for you, Lukai. What is the title of the implementation plan you're advocating for? Sorry, did you ask the title? Yes. Uh, yeah, so as we said at the start, we are not arguing for a specific plan because we do not want to get bogged down into details. We think the overall idea is more important than having 18 year term limits with uh, nominations every two years. Thank you very much. Um, do you think that it's wise to be advocating for a constitutional change without having a plan of implementation or without having the details to bog you down? Uh, yes, we do think that it's fine because we think that the main question here is whether the concept of the term limits is a good idea. Uh, and we think that it is, and the differences between the plans do not, uh, are, are not worth it discussing, and we think all, any of them would essentially be a step forward. So how many years would any plan take to implement? Uh, 
well, it depends. So the, the plan that is one of the differences. The plans uh, different. If we started immediately, it would of course take so a, a, eighteen years for everything to cycle in. But that's, there were there are some plans that uh, prolong the time period. You said that your plan would make confirmation hearings more bipartisan and would alleviate a lot of the partisanship and politicization in these hearings. How do you prevent, say, Mitch McConnell from downvoting the candidate and continuing to obstruct? Uh, so that's a part of why we explain doing that uh, costs a lot of political capital. So first we say that because every nomination is less meaningful, uh, it's less worth it for Mitch McConnell to do that. Secondly, as we've explained, when the, there's this norm that every president should get to justices, it's even costlier to do that. Uh, so of course we cannot like legally prevent it from happening, but we do believe, we believe that we uh, lowered the incentive for the Senate to do that. Thank you for finishing your thought. Thank you, Ms. Scott. That is the time for the cross-examination period. Thank you both. And now up, our next speaker will be presenting the negative team's first constructive argument for seven to nine minutes, repping Sydney, Maine, Maine DOC's other co-captain, Mr. Chandler Dougal. Proposition at issue today represents a grave threat to the foundations of our republic. Elimination of lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court in favor of term limits will bring ruin to the judiciary by robbing it of our nation's best legal minds, undermining the separation of powers which shield it and the citizenry from executive tyranny, and plunging it headlong into the maelstrom of partisan politics currently stressing our nation to a breaking point. The fact that lifetime appointments are a longstanding practice is not an argument against their efficacy, nor does the mere passage of time discredit them. Rather, the opposite is true. The longer an institution and its practices withstand the test of time, the more resilient and valuable they demonstrate themselves to be. Therefore, the affirmative's heavy burden of proof is further encumbered by over 200 years of enduring judicial history. In this speech, we will advance five arguments against term limits. First, implementation of term limits will diminish the quality of Supreme Court justices by reducing the attractiveness of serving on the court and forcing the premature retirement of eminent jurists. Adam Steele of the Campbell Law Observer rightly proclaimed in 2013 that the maximum job security offered by a lifetime appointment attracts the most qualified candidates for the court. This is particularly true when compensation is considered. Associate justices had an annual salary of $268,000 in 2021, according to the Federal Judicial Center, whereas general counsel for Pfizer made $7.1 million that same year, according to Bloomberg Law. These statistics echo the words of Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78 who argued that the absence of life tenure would dissuade the country's best jurors from becoming judges, as it would, quote, naturally discourage such characters from quitting a lucrative line of practice to accept a seat on the bench, and would have a tendency to throw the administration of justice into hands less well able and less well qualified. Under the proposed plan, the great jurists of American history would have been prevented from serving the nation to their fullest extent. For example, the venerable Chief Justice John Marshall, who served for 34 years, would have been forced to retire before the landmark cases of McCullough v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden, cases of such vital importance to our nation that they are mainstays in American history curricula. Therefore, we do not know what future great minds we will deny ourselves of by adopting this measure, but we can be certain that it would place an artificial cap on the benefit to American jurisprudence that great individuals may give us. Our second objection to term limits is that they will worsen, not ameliorate partisan fighting. The confirmation hearings of recent administrations have left none of us ignorant of the political conflagrations ignited by judicial appointments. However, the congressional struggle over judicial confirmations cannot be blamed on the court itself. Matthew Germer, fellow of the R Street Institute Governance Program, reasoned in April of this year that the problem of heated confirmation hearings lies with Congress, not with the Supreme Court, and certainly is not attributable simply to the fact of lifetime appointments. To wave away the problem presented by increasing the frequency of Senate confirmation hearings, which the proposed plan seeks to do, exemplifies the myopic and ill-conceived nature of the proposition before us today. David Giangowski of the Navy's JAG Corps elucidates the obvious unlikelihood that a senator would say to themselves, appointments happen so often that I'll take it easy on the nominee this go around. Indeed, Stephen Vladek, law professor at the University of Texas at Austin, wrote in 2017 that, quote, one has to see the world through particularly rose-colored glasses to believe that term limits would all of a sudden cause the political branches to stop holding Supreme Court seats hostage to the politics of the moment, unquote. 
But don't get me wrong. It's obvious that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer would simply cast aside their differences and become the very best of friends if only Supreme Court justices serve for 18 years. At a minimum, the maintenance of the status quo limits the frequency of contentious Senate hearings as much as possible. Then there are special interest groups, those political boogeymen which serve narrow interests ahead of the greater good. A literature re review conducted by Stephen Burbank of the University of Pennsylvania Law School argues that interest groups would be emboldened by the predictability created by term limits to further meddle in the appointments process. This in turn would create a crisis of public legitimacy and inflame partisan tensions by routinely devolving the Supreme Court down to the muck of contemporary politics. Presidential elections themselves will also become more political, partisan, and polarized, which I'm sure we all agree is precisely what our country needs today. Anthony Markham of the R Street Institute wrote in 2020 that term limits would ensure that court vacancies are inextricably tied to every presidential race and not lower the temperature around nominations, but rather leave the country scorched. Elections wherein the court could be ideologically flipped by the incoming administration would be particularly heated. A third argument against term limits is that they will lead to doctrinal instability due to the rapid turnover of justices. Rulings will be repeatedly overruled, then reinstated, and then ruled, overruled again. This comes with any implementation plan, unless our opponents propose to implement the plan over a course of, say, 50 years. An empirical study conducted by Vanderbilt law professor Susanna Sherry, published in the 2019 Texas Law Review, developed a sophisticated model that predicted what would have happened to the Roe v. Wade decision if the affirmative plan had been implemented in 1973, according to Sherry's study, which did assume 18-year term limits with biannual appointments. Roe v. Wade would have been overruled in 1987, reinstated in 2009, and then overruled again in 2017. Such judicial whiplash would have a deleterious effect on the public's faith in the court and frustrate consistent implementation of the nation's laws. A fourth flaw in the proposition is that we'll undermine judicial independence by creating a final period problem for judges. Under our current system, Supreme Court justices stay on the bench until they die, or they retire at an age when they are not looking for another job. Consider that the youngest justice to retire in recent years, David Souter, was nearly 70. Other recent retirements have occurred at more advanced ages. Kennedy at 83, Stevens 90, Sandra Day O'Connor nearly 76, and Breyer 84. Under term limits, many judges will leave the bench at an age when they will want to pursue future job opportunities. Consider that someone appointed to the court in their mid-40s will be only 63 when their 18-year term is up. Clarence Thomas would have left the court at the young age of 61. According to Washington University law professor Daniel Epps, a term-limited justice might see the court as the perfect jumping-off point for a lucrative lobbying gig or as a platform to pander to public opinion in the hopes of securing a future on Fox News or MSNBC. We want justices looking to the laws during their terms, not their political and employment futures. Finally, judicial term limits will irrevocably subvert the separation of powers in the federal government. According to a 2021 article penned by Daniel Hemmel, law professor at the University of Chicago, justices grant significant differences in their rulings to the president who appointed them. In the case of a two-term president, this would include four of the nine justices. If, as Hemmel asserts, and a grade school understanding of American civics will corroborate, the court serves as a check exec against executive power, having nearly half of the court beholden to the sitting president is an untenable position for an independent judiciary. Shelby Mars, writing the Seton Hall Circuit Review in 2017, further illuminates that a two-term president will, in effect, have appointed half of the court for a decade after they leave office, giving them incredible and lasting influence over the judiciary. Only a slim possibility under the current system, but a certainty under the proposed plan. We turn again to Mr. Burbank of the University of Pennsylvania, who determined that the elimination of life tenure would signal to the nation that the judiciary is merely a policy apparatus of the executive. History informs us that removal of life tenure undermines both the separation of powers and judicial independence. The Weimar Constitution of post-World War I Germany was described by Peabody Award-winning journalist William Schreier as, on paper, the most liberal and democratic document of its kind. It guaranteed freedom of opinion, association, and religious belief. Article 104 of that constitution established a judiciary with lifetime appointments. The Nazi party formed a democratically elected majority in the German legislature in 1933. At this point, the German Supreme Court remained independent, standing in the way of abominations such as the latter enacted Nuremberg laws. But Frederick Reuter of the Wisconsin Law Review tells us that the first step in the Nazis' destruction of judicial independence was to eliminate life tenure for the German Supreme Court. And this was accomplished through democratic means, meeting the legal requirements to amend the Weimar Constitution in 1934. Thus, 
Prior to full assumption of absolute power in Germany, the Nazi party purposefully eroded judicial independence by abrogating the life tenure established in the German constitution. Now, elimination of life tenure was not the sole reason that the Nazis were able to control the German judiciary, but it was the first step they took to achieve that end. Removal of lifetime appointments harms judicial independence. We know this because it has been purposefully and maliciously used to do so. Receiving full benefit from our best legal minds, minimizing the frequency of partisan fighting, doctrinal stability, judicial independence, and separation of powers are all achieved under our current system. It is imperative that we reject the proposition before us today, particularly if that, prop if that proposition is without a substantive plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dougal. Please remain at the lectern for cross-examination which will be provided by, for the affirmative team for two minutes, originally from Austin, Texas. Please welcome MIT's Jessica. Thank you so much. So first of Thank all, you. I have a question uh, to your first point on bringing the best minds to the Supreme Court. In the perspective of a justice, can you reiterate the main appeals of a lifelong position and why that's more, like, uh, why that's more preferable to an 18 year position? Are you, are you saying in reference to bringing the best legal minds to the court? Uh, right. Well, the having a, a position of life tenure is desirable. And, you know, especially when we consider the payment that someone who's a top legal mind could make in the private sector, that job security is one of the deciding factors that makes them choose that position. So in terms of job security, would you say that these justices are making the decision to serve on the Supreme Court because they get that financial compensation? No, they're not. They, they would make more in the private sector. It's the job security of life tenure is one of the deciding factors. Yes, they get their salary for life, but it's, you know, a pittance compared to, as we referenced, the um, salary for the general counsel of Pfizer. Thank you. And then on your side, you also state that the Supreme Court is a valuable position regardless, right? So uh, with that yes, it is. But again, the, the life tenure in and of itself is a valuable draw. It's not something that you can get in just any other job. With the motivation and the high amount of value placed on these long tenures, how do we ensure that justices are being uh, fair whenever they're trying to get these jobs and truly care about the outcome of the nation? Uh, presumably, if one gets to the point where they're being appointed as a Supreme Court justice, they have a track record that shows that they care about the rule of law and about the Constitution and are willing to make decisions to support that, even if it doesn't reflect popular opinion. And then when evaluating who is the best legal mind, what kind of metric are you using to say what kind of person is better than the other for it to be the Supreme Court justice? It's a subjective measure, but we've managed to do it for over 230 years, and I don't see why we should stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica and Chandler. Great job. And now we're going to invite some rebuttal argument. So presenting the negative team's first rebuttal argument for four to six minutes, straight out of the BK, Brooklyn, New York. Please give a warm welcome to Maine DOC's Tatiana Tomlinson. Hi, I understand that Lukai and my team may not believe the details are worth discussing, but we believe the details are important, especially when creating a new amendment and we are here to debate those exact details. First, Lukai mentioned life tenure is undemocratic. However, the founding fathers deliberately designed the Supreme Court as anti-majority institution to serve as a check on the executive and legislative branches, making the Supreme Court mirror the views of the public opinion will be counterproductive and harmful to protecting the rights of minorities. Majority of the Warren Court's decisions promoting racial equity in schools and allowing interracial marriages generated aggressive public opposition. Many of the rights enhancing decisions by the Supreme Court were anti-majority and would have never happened if the court's sole factor were pleasing the public. For example, Chief Justice Earl Warren, opinion on Brown v. Board, which allowed African-Americans to attend any school of choice is the perfect example. Also, uh, Erin Duffin of Statista last poll results from September 2022 shows the public is evenly split on approval for the Supreme Court with 42% approving and 42% disapproving with just 16 being unsure. Also, Lukai mentions life tenure is undemocratic. I mean, sorry. 
Lukai mentioned term limits will um, cure separations of power when in reality, it will make it worse. Removing the shielding from executive and legislative interference provided by life tenure will irreversibly harm the checks and branches upon which the framework of our government rests. Daniel Hemel of the University of Chicago explained in 2021 that justices show favor to the presidents who appointed them, guaranteeing that two-term presidents will have appointed nearly half of the court threatened, half of the court, which threatens too much judicial appeasement of executive wishes. As Chandler pointed out, Germ German history has already shown us the potential consequences of harming separation of powers by removing life tenure for justice. Mukai also mentions partisanship will worsen, which is ridiculous. Terms, term limits will worsen partisanship fighting over nominees by having regular confirmations every two years, making president elections more political. As Chandler already stated, heated confirmations hearings is simply a Congress issue, not the Supreme Court, and has nothing to do with lifetime appointments. Tying vacancies to the election cycle will lead to more contagious Contagious confirmation hearings, not less than them. Making such appointments regularly and on a predetermined biannual schedule will only call more attention to the court more often and will make the inevitable political fighting virtually never ending, as one side of the court will always be prepared for the preordained confirmation fight. An adequate president's appointment. Only one side, full term presidents, did not have the opportunity to appoint any justice at all. Jim, Jimmy Carter Harrison was only in office for 32 days before he succumbed to fatal illness and thus did not have the opportunity to make such appointments. The average number of Supreme Court appointments per president is approximately 2.6 appointed per each of our 46 presidents. The average is only slightly more than the proposed guarantee of two appointments per term per president. Furthermore, the guarantee provided by the imposition of 18 year term limits ensures that every two term president will control the court for at least a decade after their departure from office with full ideologically adherent justice seated on a bench. So while current practices generally allows for two nominees per president anyways, this plan promises every two-term president four picks on the Supreme Court. As for Senate obstruction, what happens if the Senate controlled by the op opposing party of the president refuses to hold their vote on a nominee or just holds their vote and rejects the nominee? McConnell did exactly that to prevent a vote on Garland, which with a ticking clock on judicial, judicial terms, this will further heighten partisanship and po polarization, raising the stakes for all branches of government where warring parties seek controlling interests. State um, doctrinal instability will not happen. However, term limits will lead to ideologically ping pong with presidents reversing back and forth due to rapid changes in the makeup of the court. An example that Chandler also mentioned is Roe v. Wade, according to Suzanne Sherry, it would have been overruled twice. Yes, we're dealing with this exact dilemma right now. However, it took, with life tenure, it took 50 years to overturn. Rather, the three to 10 years, it could potentially happen with 18 year term limits that Lukai purposely left out with a great trade-off and so-called solution for a better Supreme Court the affirmative has in mind. A single two-term president could pick 44% of the court. If two presidents of the same party serve three or four consecutive terms, an overwhelming majority of the court will quickly be ideologically one-sided. In the span of only a few years, a court of eight Scalia's can turn into a court of eight Ginsburg's. Term limits will open opportunity for every president to have a chance to monopolize the Supreme Court. The fact of the matter is every system has its flaws, but you do not remove a system that has worked for well over 200 years for 18 year term limits that does not come close to fixing the supposedly dire issues at hand. Term limits will only inflame them, making a few minor flaws in our current system that happens rarely to happen quite frequently. We cannot allow presidents to monopolize the Supreme Courts or have partisan fight and raising each and every day. And most importantly, the erosion of judicial independence and doctrinal instability with term limits will definitely cause a huge uproar within the Supreme Court. The affirmative plan is ridiculous, not well thought through, and borderline contradictory. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. And now offering the affirmative team's first rebuttal for four to six minutes, also from New York. Please welcome MIT's Carl.
Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think before we start with our reputation, refutations, let's be very clear what the framework of this debate is. I think the opposition didn't engage entirely with what we, what we talked to you about what is the right metric to weigh this debate. We say that we need to recognize there's no objectively true in terms of what makes a good court, in terms of what is a qualified candidate. We think that the only weighing mechanism is debate in this debate is how representative the court is. Because insofar as there's very little alternative for you to say that there is an alternative plan for you to evaluate what is a good court or what is a qualified judge. I think the only way for you to evaluate whether a court is good or whether justice is good is by how representative and how reflective they are about the will of the current population. Under this framework, let's take a closer look of what the opposition have given you in this debate. First, we talk to you about the quality of the judges and they say that while a life tenure is going to attract more qualified judges. Let's, take, let's be very clear that the Supreme Court on either side of the house is going to be the best job you can get as a law pr practitioner. Like every pre pre person who studies law and who does law like obviously wants to be the Supreme Court justice. So it's unclear to us to what extent just by reducing your tenure by 12 years is going to reduce the attractiveness of the Supreme Court job. Obviously, everyone still wants it. The second thing they tell you is about compensation. They say that, well, they will earn less money in our world or in their world. But again, we say that the candidate is probably already wealthy and privileged in the first place. Like when you are in the Supreme Court justice poll, you are probably already a very privileged person to have earned like a, like a good degree in law. What this means is that they're probably not going to be like be lured by the money and like after their career or whatever. Like if you ask them, if I don't give you any compensation and are you willing to work as a Supreme Court justice, they'll probably still say yes. So it's unclear to us how that attractiveness would significantly go down on our side of the house. But thirdly, I think we flip this argument by saying that you actually get less qualified judges on their side of the house. Why is this the case? Because first, we think that on their side of the house, the justices are still appointed by a president, but they, they were appointed by presidents who nominated them like 30 years ago or so. So we say that in terms of deciding the current issues, they're less capable because when they were nominated, they probably weren't evaluated by how qualified they are in terms of evaluating issues now. So a lot of issues, things like abortion, may not be a hot issue like 30 years ago, so they aren't capable of making those kind of decisions for the people in our world today. So we say that you actually get less quality on their side of the house. The second thing I talked to you is about partisanship. And they say that, well, because you increase the frequency of the contentions and uh, you know, interest groups might uh, get involved. We have a few responses. The first is that just by increasing the frequency of the contentions doesn't mean that you get more contentions because we think that every time when you try to nominate a candidate, it get less heat, it get le it get less hyped because the value of the court is not so significant. So instead, so like we trade off basically the frequency over like intensity of every contention. So it's unclear to us to what extent contentions will be higher or lower on either side of the house. But what we give you is that we say that. To the best, like even in their best case scenario, this is going to be a very marginal difference because the court is currently very political in their world already, right? As Luca pointed to you, that the court justices are already voting along party lines regardless. So it's unclear to us how worse, how like how it could get like much worse on our side of the house. But second, we say that justices are likely to be consistent with their like with their decisions. That is to say that in their side of the house, even though the justice are like ha having a life tenure, they are still nominated by presidents and they are still approved by Congresses. The only difference is that they were approved and nominated by the po politicians that nominated them 30 years ago. That is to say that insofar as they are to the same extent politicized and you know like tie have tied relationships between the politicians and the Congress and, and, and the White House, we prefer a world in which they are more closely tied to current politicians because these politicians reflect the current views. So insofar as the politicization or the polarization is at their best the same on both sides of the house, we prefer a world that they stay closer to the will of the current people. The third responses that we have is that the composition of the court would be would be more stagnant and that would cause more polarization on the rest of the house. Because at the end of the day, we don't care whether a particular like an individual justice is Republican or a Democrat. What we care is the composition of the court. I think on their side of the house, once the Republicans, for example, get a 6-3 split on the, on the Supreme Court, that split is going to stay for a significantly longer time. So for example, when you have 
a politicized or a polarized court on their set of house, that situation is going to remain bad for a significantly longer period of time than on our set of house. On our set of house, even if we occasionally get like a uneven split in terms of the opinions of the court, we can easily correct that through the dynamics of the next elections or the next domination. So in terms of fixing polarization and rebalancing the power on the Supreme Court, I think we do a better job on our set of house than on theirs. Now, the third point that I gave you is about uh, instability. I think we have two simple responses. First is that we think even on our side of the house, justice will still have the norm to respect precedents because they understand that they don't want their decisions to get overturned by the future pre- by the future justices. So there's always going to be a norm of, re- uh, of respecting the precedents on either side of the house. But maybe we do get slightly more instability in terms of decision- decisions on our side of the house. But why is this good? Because we tell you that we were willing to trade off stability versus the quality of the decisions. We say that we would prefer that you make consistent, like we would prefer that you make good decisions, even if you have flip flop a uh, few times, rather than having consistently bad decisions. So you have, even if you have a wrong decision or bad decision, and that bad decision lasts 30 years, that decision lasts 50 years, we think that world is much less preferable than our world when we do have a correction system that we constantly and dynamically correct the wrong and bad decisions that we have made in the past. So I think that addresses the problem of instability. The final thing that they told you is about that's, uh, independence. That's your, that's your time, Carl. I'm sorry to stop you. Time is up, though, so thank you very much for your passionate argument. Appreciate you. And everyone, we've now reached the halfway point of the debate, leading us in the opening round, uh, the second round, by presenting the negative team's second constructive set of arguments for six to eight minutes, hailing from Standish, Maine. Please give a warm welcome to Maine DOC's Sean Libby. Thank you. This speech will focus on bolstering three arguments against eliminating life tenure. It will show how instituting term limits for Supreme Court justices would indeed erode judicial independence, cause doctrinal instability, and foster incessant Senate obstruction. Firstly, term limits are a bad idea because they would erode judicial independence. The framers granted judges the protection of life tenure so they would be able to decide cases based on the rule of law and the Constitution, free of pressure from political branches or the popular trends of the majority. Our opponents seem to think it should be the popular opinion, which Tatiana showed us would have set our country back decades within the civil rights era. Alexander Hamilton tells us in Federalist number 78, quote, nothing can contribute so much to the judiciary's firmness and independence as permanency in office. And this quality may therefore be justly regarded as an indispensable ingredient in its constitution, unquote. Without the protection of life tenure, judges couldn't fulfill their roles, which Chief Justice William William Rehnquist compared, quote, to that of a referee in a basketball game who is obliged to call a foul against a member of the home team at a critical moment in the game. He will be soundly booed but he is nonetheless obliged to call it as he saw it, not as the whole crowd wants him to, unquote. Term limits, on the other hand, would leave judges unprotected from political pressure and increase the likelihood they would decide cases politically, thereby eroding judicial independence. The most glaring example of this would come in a judge's final period on the bench when they would begin preparing for life after the court. Knowing that their term is ending would present a new type of external pressure to make decisions that would set them up for future employment. University of Chicago law professor William Baud articulates the full evolution of this by saying, quote, there will be a natural tendency to start auditioning for one's next job. In their last year on the bench, the justice realizes they'll never be a justice again. So they may as well seize the day. And the next to last year, they realize they'll be seizing the day next year. So they may as well start this year. And the next to next last year, they'll do the same thing and so on, unquote. We're always told we should start preparing for retirement early. So how long would it, would it be until judges start positioning themselves for retirement their first year on the bench? essentially reducing Supreme Court justices to political guns for hire. As University of Minnesota law professor David Strauss tells us that a judge might think to himself, quote, the political opportunity has never been greater for us to advance a particular doctrine or to overrule a particular doctrine. Thus, I'm going to reach out and take a case that the court otherwise wouldn't have taken, unquote. A second problem with the affirmative position is that term limits will cause doctrinal institution, instability, sorry. Our opponents advocate appointing a new justice every two years. This would create more turnover and therefore frequent ideological swings on the court, which George Gomez of the First Liberty Institute tells us, quote, could lead to more frequent shifts in the interpretation of law or even short cycles in which major precedents are discarded only to be reinstated later, unquote. Under term limits, the two most senior justices, Clarence Thomas and John Roberts, would be the first to retire. This means that if a Democrat is reelected in 2024, 
those vacancies would be filled with two liberal judges quickly swinging the court from a, a dominant 6-3 conservative majority to a 5-4 liberal majority. That's just simple math that our opponents of all people should understand. There is no doubt that a liberal majority would restore abortion rights, New York's concealed carry law, and the EPA's authority to enforce reducing power plant emissions. That would overrule three major cases from this year alone. And it is also certain that a liberal court would overrule the 2010 Citizens United case allowing unlimited election donations by corporations, nonprofits, and unions. Regardless of our personal political opinions, such rapid vacillations in the legal landscape are undesirable particularly when one considers that these decisions could be quickly re uh, reinstated if a Republican wins in 2028. Furthermore, according to Anthony Markham of the R Street Institute, quote, the potential for ideological ping pong on our highest court could also damage our common law system, unquote. Constant changes on the court would threaten the stability and predictability of judicial precedent and tradition, thereby weakening the integrity of the court. As James Madison warns in Federalist Number 62, quote, laws will be a little of of little avail to people if they are repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant changes that no man knows what the law is today or can guess what it will be tomorrow. Law is defined to be a rule of action, but now, but how can that rule be a rule which is of little known and less fixed, unquote. With laws changing back and forth due to this ideological ping pong, nearly identical cases could be judged differently within the same decade, depending solely on which party won the most recent presidential election. This, these rapid reforms and subsequent reversals of law would have Americans flinching as if we all suffer from collective battered child syndrome, while the loss of actual and perceived integrity of the judicial process would leave the court without even the pretense of legitimacy. So we can easily see that the, the term limits would be far too destabilizing to do the judici judiciary and the country as a whole. Another issue which could affect doctrinal instability is that every time a different party takes over the presidency and is guaranteed to appoint court, uh, court justices, citizens, state attorneys general, and special interest groups around the country will flood the lower courts with the anticipation of getting their case heard in the front of the Supreme Court that will soon swing in their favor. Furthermore, many cases never make it to the Supreme Court and are indeed decided and precedent set in the lower circuit courts. This would cause presidents to nominate more hardline justices to the lower courts where they would still have life tenure under our proponent's plan. Uh, opponents plan, sorry. These justices could then postpone and delay their decisions until a favorable Supreme Court exists that they know will confirm their rulings. The congestion and maneuvering in the lower courts would also cause other pertinent legal cases to move at a snail's pace in our already lengthy legal process. Finally, term limits are a bad idea because they would foster incessant Senate obstruction. Our opponent's reasoning that giving each president two appointments at regular intervals makes the process fair and commonplace, thus reducing the stakes and the political vitriol of the confirmation process. But when we consider that and the increasingly hostile divide along party lines, the propagation of divisive political rhetoric and the promotion of political violence that sparked an insurrection and threatened the peaceful transfer of power, we see that this reasoning is simply absurd. To, to this point, Matthew Germer of the R Street Institute writes, quote, for example, the majority of party in the Senate could choose to reject the judicial nominee or delay confirmation and leave that seat vacant in anticipation of winning back the White House in the next election. As Tatiana discussed, this is exactly what happened in 2016 when the Republican Party refused to grant Merrick Garland a hearing for the last 10 months of President Obama's term, only to then in 2020, hypocritically push through the Republican nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, with just weeks remaining in Donald Trump's term. To quote Anthony Markham from the R Street Institute, quote, when a regularized vacancy process finally does roll into place, what is to stop the Senate from not confirming a nominee to fill that vacancy? Go further. With 18-year terms, what is to stop a Senate refusing to hear four years' worth of nominees, giving the next president potentially four open seats in just his first term? None of us would be the least bit surprised if that happened. In fact, we'd probably be more surprised if it didn't happen. Unsurprisingly, our opponents have drastically failed at engineering any meaningful arguments that will improve the United States Supreme Court. In fact, it is almost certain to break our highest court beyond repair. We must reject this inane proposition before us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Libby. And now presenting the affirmative team's second constructive argument for six to eight minutes. Originally from Snowmass, Colorado, please give a warm welcome to MIT's Matilda. All right. So in our first 
speech, Luca explained our first two points. The issue of encouraging strategic blocking and of politicizing the nomination process. These points were further defended in the first cross examination and the first rebuttal. I would now like to go into our remaining points. We will add two more points to the speech. To our third point, we will address strategic retirements. Sitting justices considering retirement are acutely aware of the influence and sway that their successors would have if they were to retire. And as such, they have an incentive to consider what kinds of justices would be likely to secede them based on when they choose to retire. To this point, Oliver writes in 2012 that justices may well time their retirement decisions to increase the likelihood that their replacements on the court will continue to represent their viewpoints. As a result, justices with one political leaning or another become incentivized to retire during the term of a party whose president's best reflects a term of president whose party best reflects those leanings. This is empirically corroborated by Chabot in 2016, as they find that if the incumbent president is of the same party as the president who nominated the justice to the court, and if the incumbent president is in the first two years of a four-year presidential term, then the justice has odds of resignation that are about 2.6 times higher than those when the two conditions are not met. The main harm is that this reduces the capacity for accountability. When justices have the ability to strategically retire, they get a greater role in choosing their successor. Thus, both reducing public integrity in the court and further removing the court from public accountability. As Calabresi writes in 2006, strategic retirements give the justices too much power in picking their own successors, which can lead to a self-perpetuating oligarchy. The current system also creates the impression that the justices are more political actors than judges, which damages the rule of law. Under term limits, successor would, successors would only serve the remainder of the 18-year term. So even if there is strategic retirement, it results in the successor having much less influence due to holding a short term. We hence reduce polarization in the candidates and in the nomination process, thus reducing the incentive and ability to strategically retire. This idea is further supported by Chilton in 2021. Adopting term limits could reduce the share of years in which justices were appointed when the Senate and President were controlled by the same party. For our fourth point, we will look at the Supreme Court's political detachment from the current US population. This can be broken up into two elements, unrepresentative judges and a politically outdated court composition. First, looking at unrepresentative judges. The main problem is that justices are out of step with the public. Looking back at the foundation we built in our first case, it's understood that with higher life expectancy and no term limits, justices are serving longer and longer terms, leading them being on the court much longer than anticipated. While in the court, justices generally remain static in their belief, but this whole time the public sentiments are changing. So by the end of the term, the general public is on a very different page than the justices. To illustrate this, consider how a justice serving the 30th year is more likely to be out of step with public sentiment than a justice serving their 18th year. In 2009, Nieder explained how older judges are detached from the mainstream, writing, there is something unseemly about de decisions affecting the lives and fortunes of American citizens being made by persons disengaged from the act of worse force. Detachment from society is a constant threat for the justices. Further, justices are not chosen directly by voters, so once they enter office, they are entirely unaccountable to the people. As Cooper says in 2021, life tenure is anti-democratic as judges become unaccountable to the electorate. By implementing term limits, the cap of 18 years, we guarantee that justices don't serve too long past when they were initially elected, which means that even the longest serving justices are still not entirely separate from the desires of the people. In addition, the increased frequency of appointments creates more opportunities to elect justices that do represent the interests of the people. Term limits could mean democratic accountability. Senators are meant to assert the will of the people during the confirmation process, but this process has become ineffective due to the very slow turnover of the court. The main harm of allowing justices to serve life terms removed from any mechanism of public accountability causes outdated application of the law. Justices who were nominated decades ago by president who served the American public of decades ago are applying principles that have not been revised since because they, they had no reason to be revised. And as pressure to nominate younger judges continues and as life expectancy increases, we see this issue proliferate. The second element here is the politically outdated court composition. The key problem here is that courts are too inflexible, so the dynamics within the court stay the same for a long time. Random chance is the dominant influence of the timing of the replacements of justices, and filtering in new justices is infrequent and inequitable in the status quo. All this leads to a very small chance that the court is in tune to the application of law and the beliefs of current society. In 2015, Chemerensky explains how an 18-year system with two-year vacancies is the best system, as they write that the absence of term limits means that a president's ability to select justices is based on the fortuity of when vacancies occur. Carter had no vacancies to fill. By contrast, Nixon got to select four justices in his first two years of office and reshaped the Supreme Court in a way that lasted four generations. 
two term limits each presidential terms would systematically tie in the makeup of the court to the current political belief, as demonstrated in the electing of the president who nominated the current judge. In this way, the justice being nominated tends to have more accountability to contemporary issues than the justice in the status quo. Also in his 2018 writing, Chemerinsky furthers that having a vacancy every two years would give all presidents the chance to equally influence the court. 18 years is long enough to allow a justice to master the job, but not so long as to risk a court that reflects political choices from decades earlier. We see a similar problem occur with the courts as we saw with the individual judges, but systematically baked into the American judicial process. Given that the US undergoes con continuous political, social, and technological evolution, it is imperative that our court evolve with it. Otherwise, the court will fail to serve the American public with sound reasoning and relevant context. The proposition mitigates this by standardizing terms, standardizing the overall nomination cycle, and showing how this results in a more conscious Supreme Court. To this end, we advocate for the most sustainable judicial future. As it is, the American judicial system exists in its own world, operating in a bubble 20 years behind the rest of us. Life tenure allows archaic beliefs to survive long past their tenure, holding back the entire country. Until we change this system, the America of the future will be forever held back by the America of the past. In our two constructive speeches, we explain the four key issues and impacts of the current system, as well as the basis for these issues. Our basis was to uphold the will of the people. Our first issue was the prevalence of partisanship in the nomination process. Our second issue was the politicization of the selection process. Our third issue was the manipulation of vacancies on the Supreme Court. And our fourth issue was the Supreme Court's detachment from the American public. For each of these issues, we explained how the Supreme Court term limits resolved this problem. With term limits, a vote for the proposition on behalf of the judges will bring the court out of its bubble and into the present, allowing us to move into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matilda. Good job. And now presenting the affirmative team's second rebuttal for five minutes from Houston, Texas. Please welcome MIT Santi. We've heard a lot of different arguments talking about partisanship, about the integrity of the court, and about how our current status quo is incredibly divided, incredibly partisan, and not representative. Now, the opposition has talked a lot to the extent in which all of these issues will worsen, but I want to make one quick clarification. It's not enough to just talk about the fact that partisanship currently exists. We need to look at why it is so rampant within the Supreme Court system. That is the prominent tenant and prominent pillar of our entire case that goes completely uncontested by the opposition. We tell you specifically that yes, the Senate and the president are partisan, but the reason why they're incentivized to turn most nomination processes into political spectacles, where there's this ideological ping pong between the individuals, is because the justices have so much perceived power. When the president and the Senate believe that that when one justice alone it means that they will be able to control the court for decades to come, then they have an incentive to make it into a political spectacle. However, what we tell you on our side in our world is that when you get more of these uh, term limits, you both increase the frequency of which they occur and decrease the relative value that they have on a political level, meaning that now there is less of an incentive to put all of these, uh, all of your eggs into one basket and block the nominees or to turn into a spectacle. The reason why this is so important is because all of the talks of partisanship that Chandler, Tatiana, and Sean talk about all only exist in their world. The reason why the, we would have so much ideological ping pong, a lack of moderation, and more doctrinal instability is because the justices are partisan right now. But in our world, you end up with a system where justices on average become more moderated, are closer to the will of the people, and are higher quality.
Let's go more in depth into what they talk about. First, it's important to recognize that a lot of the talks that they have in terms of attractiveness and doctrinal instability and the crumbling of our institutions is blatantly fear mongering. It is based on this notion that we will get completely wide shifts in our institutions and that we will no longer have respect for rule of law. But there is, in fact, no concrete justification for why this would actually be the case. Only a lot of strong rhetoric and a lot of powerful passion from their side. Let's look at attractiveness. Carl in his speech gives you very succinct analysis for why the job is still going to be attractive. It is the highest court in all of the land, which means that they're still going to have a very good resume booster. And on top of that, they're still going to have a lot of wealth and privilege by virtue of being there. We're still going to have a lot of qualified justices. But even if you don't buy this analysis, it is still the case in our on, on our side, you get higher focus on quality when you dampen the partisanship and partisan politics within the nomination process, meaning on average, the justices end up being more qualified. Next on partisanship. Again, the entire core of this argument is that partisanship exists in the status quo. We argue that it exists specifically because we don't have term limits and it's so large. We're not going to argue that we're going to completely do away with partisanship. Instead, what we're arguing is it is only on our side of the house in our world that you have any opportunity for bipartisanship and for an end to the partisanship that we see in the status quo. We also cleanly tell you that when they happen more frequently, there's less incentive to politicize them, meaning there is less incentive to have these blocks, less incentive to only nominate incredibly partisan nominees, and less incentive to completely stack the court. Next on this notion of doctrinal instability, Chandler and Sean talk continuously as though justices will be completely ideological and will make decisions based on mob rule and undermine instability. Again, this primarily happens in their world when you have these incentives. But even if you don't believe this, at the very least, when we do have sways in our world, it is both easier to correct by virtue of the fact that we have increases in frequency appointments. And as a result, you end up having uh, the decisions that are more close to what the average voter actually wants, which links into overall representation. Fundamentally, a lot of the tenets of having more judicial independence don't come down to concrete ideas. They come down to anti-democratic sentiments and rhetoric at their core. But even then, we also tell you and give you clear analysis that justices are still going to respect precedent because they don't want their decisions to be overruled as well. We're still going to have qualified justices making decisions on their own terms. What changes is that they are more qualified more moderate and closer to the will of the people. Overall, let's look at a broad level. On our world, we have a system in which at the very least you have a higher likelihood of more qualified justice and more moderate justices that better uphold the representation of the people that this government was supposed to protect. On their side, you have at best a couple of, per, of maybe issues that may or may not actually prop up that we can correct for as well. And a lot of overall issues that only exist because of the ideological partisanship that exists on their side of the house. We solve their issues. Vote for us. Thank you. Thank you for your impassioned case, Santi. Next up in response, presenting the negative team's second rebuttal for five minutes, hailing from Maine, Maine DOC's Daniel Porter. I'm honestly not really sure where to start. Um, my first line was going to be that there's no concrete justification or empirical evidence, which um, they said themselves, so it's, it's really hard to say. Carl stated that most important metric to measure the Supreme Court is the popularity and how it represents the people's voice. We would strongly disagree with that. We would state that the Supreme Court should not, not reflect um, the, the, the people's opinions. Uh, we want the Supreme, we should want the Supreme Court to do what is right, regardless of whether it is popular or what we should want a branch of government that is independent from the whims of public opinion. And when you think about this statement, think about the Bill of Rights and things like that. Think about, um, oh, 150 years ago when popular public opinion thought that slavery was a good idea. These systems are set in place for reasons and they evolve over time. Um, strategic retirement was something that my opponent mentioned and harped on quite a bit. Um, strategic retirement is a joke, really. Justices Ginsburg and Breyer didn't retire underneath Obama with a Democrat-run Senate. Justices Thomas and Alito didn't take their opportunity to retire under Trump with a Republican-run Senate. Uh, Daniel Hemmel, David Strauss, and Stephen Burbank, who my teammates have already cited, 
um, have all concluded along with us here at BMDOC that there is no empirical evidence for strategic retirement. As far as current uh, Supreme Court popularity, uh, they kept on talking about that. The current Supreme Court popularity, according to a Gallup poll by Jeffrey Jones, suggests that Congress has 7%, the presidency has 23%, and the Supreme Court has 25%. Given that, MIT should be able to do the math that maybe they should make an amendment and fix Congress. Maybe they should make an amendment to fix the presidency before they start working away at the Supreme Court. As far as judicial independence is concerned, um, <clears throat> a system of frequent and predictable op opponents seems likely to hasten a crisis of legitimacy. The public would view the Supreme Court not as a part of a political system, but as part of ordinary politics. Judicial independence would become the junior partner to judicial accountability, or the partnership would be dissolved completely. Our opponents kept talking about increased polarization. Um, I just want to bring to their attention, I don't know if they had thought about it, but with each presidential race, the Supreme Court justices that were going to be replaced would be known long before the presidential candidates themselves. Therefore, hyper-partisanship would merely shift from one arena, the confirmation process, to another, the permanent campaign. One of the things that our opponents touched on that I want to make sure that I talk about is that they suggested that a bad decision would no longer last 20, 30 years, that it would get overturned again. And they thought that that was a sure answer in their world. Well, in my world, if a bad decision can get turned over quickly, it seems like a good decision could probably get overturned pretty quickly as well. So I don't really understand the argument there. If we're going to finally get a good decision to pass, and then we're gonna throw that one out every two years as well. That doesn't seem like a very stable argument to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, Carl said that there's slightly more instability with their plan. I'm really failing to see why we should throw away the system that's worked for the last 170 years, you know, and, and take a plan that has less, stabil less stability. One of the last things I want to touch on before I run out of time is doctrinal instability. It's one of the main points of our case, and it's one of the things that I believe that they have failed to address. Uh, a case would go, this is a study by uh, Professor Sherry of the Vanderbilt Law School. And she suggests that a case would go from a sure winner to a sure loser throughout one election cycle. Um, Abandoning fundamental constitutional norms um, could be a slippery slope. I, we should think of Venezuela and Poland over the last few years. And I think that it's, it's important for us to not, we should not think ourselves immune to such things, such extreme outcomes as everybody here, everybody that's listening to me right now, we all remember January 6th of last year. And we know what can happen if we abandon law and abandon fundamental constitutional norms in order to just see what will happen, you know, just um, just try this out. So I appreciate and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Now both teams will present their closing remarks for 90 seconds, beginning the affirmative team. From MIT, please welcome back to lectern Jessica. Thank you. Throughout my teammates' speeches, we have advocated our side through sterling logic and evidence. First off, to clear the air on having a specific plan, we've provided you a reasoning for why we should consider the base principles of term limits and not the minute discrepancies, and we've given you the long-term outlook on this progress. First off, while the opposition contends that we lose quality justices by capping terms, we tell you the harms of generational detachment are much worse, and we tell you that what is right and what is objective is arbitrary to define in this round. Then, when the opposition states that we lose the separation of powers and judicial independence, we tell you that having a very defined lack of public representation in the status quo is far more of a detriment. And finally, while the opposition argues that we shouldn't remove a working system, we respond that term limits preserve this system from erosion and prevent the long-term impacts of mistakes and manipulation. The test of time does not exempt us from seeking improvement. 
At the apex of this round, we see two worlds emerge. In the world of the opposition, the justices serving lifelong terms see unchecked power compared to the other branches and use this power to prevent the American past at the expense of the American present, divorced from the worries of the citizen. In the world of the proposition, we reconcile pursuit of sustainability with contemporary awareness in the court. Justices can no longer remain indifferent to the evolving nation because they have a reliable and structured means towards passing on their torch. It's because we champion the will of the people and uphold equitable courts that we are proud to stand on side proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And now we'll hear the negative team's closing remarks from Maine DOC's Victoria Scott. It would be much easier to deny the affirmative if they actually knew what they were asking for. Their arguments were very reminiscent of the idiom that failure to plan is a plan for failure. Luca's first constructive promoted a non-plan of abstract vagaries that failed to impress with its non-committal lack of detail. He and Santiago sold a utopian dream that falls somewhere between being childishly naive and willfully ignorant. Initiating a constitutional amendment without practical understanding and concrete logistics is recklessly irresponsible and, abs and absurd on its face. One study by Sital Kalantri, a clinical professor of Cornell Law School, found that retiring justices in India pander to their decisions involving the government. The Indian constitution bars justices from private practice, but the affirmative short-sighted and ill-conceived proposal doesn't account for the cascade of necessary constitutional amendments that are sure to follow the capricious imposition of 18-year terms. The affirmative's plan to impose 18-year limits will result in a bipolar roller coaster of unpredictable judicial precedent that will crumble the foundation of our constitution and common laws. Matilda and Jessica both spoke of manipulation, but they spoke selectively so about manipulation. Manipulation could also be involved in tying election cycles to the bench. People could buy their Oval Office with their third running mates by advertising judges and selling seats. Thank you, Ms. Scott. All right, great job, both teams. This now con concludes the debate portion of our contest. And while the judges are tabulating the final scores, I'd just like to thank both teams for their hard work and willingness to collaborate and really just personify the power of education. I think we can all agree that was uh, an incredible matching of wits and that's what today's all about, you know, amplifying these amazing minds and voices. And that's what the National Prison Debate League is here to do. I think that no matter what the judges end up deciding on their scorecards, I think we can also agree that there were no losers at this event today. So thank you both for all of your hard work. And I know to that point, Chandler Dougal of Maine DOC would like to I'll have a few moments to address MIT uh, about this opportunity to engage. So Chandler, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, yes, I, I'm gonna speak briefly on behalf of all my teammates. Um, we really appreciate you guys being willing to do this. Uh, we appreciate the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison, uh, Maine DOC. Um, there's you know a little over a dozen people here in the room with us and you know well over a hundred that were probably involved in making this possible. So. Uh, we're really grateful for all of that, and we hope that regardless of how this goes, that we showed that, you know, people like us um, can do a lot more than maybe we get given credit for. Um, and we greatly appreciate MIT, we greatly appreciate the judges. Uh, Daniel from NPDL, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you, Mr. Dougal. And would anyone from MIT's team like to respond to, to Maine about this experience or opportunity? The floor is yours if you'd like to respond. Yes, uh, first off, uh, we would like to say thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this. It's really cool to be able to debate y'all and see what you've been working on. Um, and this is really a great initiative that we've never heard anything like it. So thank you so much. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks. Thank everybody here for their willingness. They put in a lot of work and obviously you can see this is a complex issue and it required a lot of research, a lot of study, a lot of collaboration. What you see on the main DOC side, not only we have a co-ed debate here, but you can see they're all in the same location. 
And it's unprecedented as far as my experience that Maine DOC has allowed for um, this work to happen in a, in a very transformative way. And I hope that that will show some leadership for other prison systems and what's possible. And by allowing uh, for these sort of opportunities because it is, it is transcendent. And I think, again, that speaks for itself. So I don't need to do it for you, but thank you all for your participation. It's amazing. And just so everyone's aware, before we go to the judges and, and hear from them, after the contest winners are declared and we hear from our judges, we're gonna transition into a panel discussion in which we can get, have an interactive post-game discussion for all the viewers who've been watching and I'm sure have a lot to ask and comment on. So we'll be fielding questions through the Alliance and are happy to get interactive with all of our viewers today so we can, the participants can hear from them and you can hear from them directly in response. So please stick around for that. And with that said, Mr. Atchison, Chief Judge, are our scores ready to be announced, sir? Do you have a winner to declare? Not quite yet. We are waiting on three judges to email. They're coming close. We have two decisions in. So give us just one more moment and hopefully we'll have it. That's a sign of a great debate. I can tell no you problem. that's a sign of a great debate that the judges have to take some time to get it ready. Yeah, we had a few math jokes today. So I guess uh, you guys are right on, on par with that. But uh, yeah, take your time, make sure they're all correctly counted and uh, double checked and we'll make sure that the, that announcement is comes as whenever you're ready. And in the meantime, do you have anything you'd like to share with the participants yourself, uh, Mr. Atchison? I'm happy to while we wait for some emails to roll in. I've had the privilege of judging the final round of the national debate tournament four times. And I can tell you from that experience to this experience, what the audience is seeing today represents the power of preparation. These students are not just speaking off the cuff. These people are not just engaging you know, with what they happen to feel at the moment. This experience demonstrates the power that can come with educational opportunities that provide an avenue for that preparation. We heard quotations from incredibly important people, some of which like Erwin Chemerinsky, our former debaters, and other people who did rigorous empirical data all put together in an organized civil dialogue that manifested itself in disagreement and that that disagreement was put on an incredible display for us all to be able to enjoy. So while the decision is coming momentarily and we'll see the ballots roll in, I must admit that from my position as the director of debate at Wake Forest University and the president of the American Forensic Association, I hope that this is the start of many more of these kinds of opportunities and would happily volunteer Wake Forest University to participate in opportunities just like this is I'm sure the panelists and colleagues would as well, because this was a phenomenal experience and thank everyone uh, for letting me be a part of it. So with that being said, I'm going to go back to my email and check to see if we have any more ballots. Okay. Just let me know when you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Atchison. Does anyone else in the judging panel who's already scored, would they like to uh, add anything while we wait for the final tabulation? If so, feel free, Mr. Price, if, 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 uh, if not. Any thoughts? Yeah, this is just an amazing gift. And this is the result of education and application. And that is what we want for everybody. And I think that people who are incarcerated who are pursuing education deserve to apply the education they're obtaining. And on this panel, on the main side, there are people here with undergraduate degrees and advanced master's degrees. So. Um, you know, this, this debate, like I said in the beginning, is something to prepare people for more than just uh, political work and policy work. This is preparing people for life. This is preparing people to advocate for themselves. And um, it's amazing to see people constructively come together and debate towards a goal. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to, you know, acknowledge this. And we really hope to continue our work with the Prison Debate League. Uh, we hope that we can obtain the support necessary to really highlight Daniel's work. I don't know how much you all know about Daniel. He's done um, uh, almost 19 years, I think it was, Daniel, and straight in prison. He's only been home three months, and he has hit the ground running. He's working also. So this was done on the side. He's doing this um, on his own out of passion, and he's been doing this for years. So this is groundbreaking. This is a historical moment for the field of higher education in prison, historical moment for um, the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison, and 
um, yeah, this is hopefully just the beginning of something monumental that we can build on and develop expertise for people who are incarcerated. So, um, you know, they have a better approach at life and inside and once they return. So, yeah, with that, thank you. And I'll yield back to Daniel. Thank well, you if much. you're comfortable with yielding to me, I have a decision. Are we ready? Yeah, the floor, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. It's my so. pleasure to announce that at the inaugural debates that we just experienced with five judges, the decision is a five to zero for the Maine Department of Corrections, a five to zero win for Maine DOC. Congratulations on an outstanding debate, and thank you all so much for the opportunity to judge it. Thank you very much, Mr. Asherson. And uh, absolutely amazing. Like I said, there are no losers here today, but I think we can see there are also no inferior minds. You can't cage the mind, and that was on full display today. And I'm super proud to be able to bring that to everyone through the National Prison Debate League. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get the support we need to continue to do this important work as we expand, and we're looking to do so with the cooperation of Everyone who's interested, so get a hold of us and MIT. Again, thank you so much for participating and and giving your time and energy to this event because it doesn't happen without you. So um, you should be very proud of your showing today and certainly the sharing of humanity that took place as well because you just defied some serious social boundaries as well as made a heck of a case. So thank you so much for your participation. Hopefully we can continue this conversation in the panel discussion, but congratulations to everybody. Uh, you're all winners in my book and just can't wait to carry this work forward with everyone's support. So thank you all so much for showing up and showing out. And uh, we're gonna transition to the Alliance to facilitate the panel discussion now. Thank you all so much. Yeah, feel free to drop questions into the Q&A. Congratulations, Maine. Um, MIT, you put up a, a heck of a fight today and um, you broke a lot of barriers. You really broke a lot of barriers and norms um, and you're ushering in something new for this field to consider. And so, you know, as Daniel said, there's no losers in this. Everybody's a winner. And you just opened up a space uh, that has very rarely been seen to the public eye um, and has very rarely happened. So um, you all deserve a lot of um acknowledgement for that as well. Um, to the audience, please feel free to drop in questions. I will begin vetting them and asking them as they roll in. Um, this first one comes from Helena, and it is, um, how can other prisons, correctional facilities get involved in this? Um, I can, I would, you can ask Daniel this, and then maybe we could also ask um, some, somebody on the DOC side, who is, have been so graciously um, and moved so swiftly in bringing this together. They brought people from multiple locations, hours apart from each other into one facility. And anybody who's been working in the DOC space knows how hard that is with such short notice and they did it so willfully. So I will yield that question to Daniel or anybody um, with Maine DOC who would like to address how you all were able to pull these strings and get it to happen, and what other DOCs might be able to learn on how to, um, to scale this out to a broader um, population. Yeah, thank you, Ben. I, I would just briefly say that it really just requires this collaborative spirit, um, because obviously that's all it takes. Um, when it comes to logistics, yeah, I mean, people have to make approvals and people have to be willing to step up and rise to these occasions as all the participants did today. But obviously it takes a lot of coordination and that requires some resources and so, you know, security approvals are tough in the DOC. So to have the main team for anyone who's not aware, as, as Vet alluded to, they came from four separate facilities and we're obviously we're, we're dealing with a co-ed team and we have men and women sharing the same space in, in a secure location that it's unprecedented. And Maine took that risk because they saw, they didn't see it as a risk. They saw it as a progressive move to show what people are capable of when those barriers are removed. And you see the results of that, it's undeniable. And there were no incidents, there were no security problems, and it was a hugely positive outcome for everyone. So if DOCs can see what that looks like and see what's possible, then, those doors are now open, which again is rare in a DOC. We're trying to open doors. But to the DOC side of it, I would love to hear some perspective based on 
how you know the comfortability in doing so. I know that is a tough decision as a as a security professional. So um, we can bring a DOC. I think is in the um, audience and or Ryan's in the audience. We can bring them up on screen. Do you want me to invite Anna to be a panelist? I believe we have someone at the lectern now. Oh, great. Good afternoon. I'm Tony Cantil, the warden here at the Maine Correctional Center. Uh, and Daniel, I think you're hitting upon the head just to summarize quickly and give the room back to um, the participants. But I think it's just a matter of building community and building up relationships and understanding that there's a level of risk we have to take. And from what we've gathered here today, what you can't see is not just this room, but many rooms across the campus here of peers, staff, and others just joining together and watching this event. Um, so I think we're just trying to develop a foundation and platform that things like this can be done um, and support all the hard work. So thank, so thank you. Well, Warden, I appreciate, I applaud your your courage in doing so because that's real leadership. You Maine DOC has pioneered this. This is our first official event. I've worked with the Massachusetts DOC for two decades, and uh, I'm well versed in in how to navigate their system. But you guys have been so amazing and. I just can't thank you enough for this doesn't happen without you guys taking that risk. And I'm glad that everyone sees that sometimes risks are just in our minds, right? It's, it's DO, MIT brought it up earlier. Some, there's a lot of fear that it's in play in these decisions, but doesn't mean it's going to be realized. And I think that everyone proved that today by comporting themselves so admirably. So thank you, thank you. very much, Gordon. Well, thank you. And thank you on behalf of all the sites here at the main DOC and all our support from our central office and the partnerships that we have all across. Thank you. Yeah, we look forward to a continued working relationship. So thank you so much. Yeah, this is just magical right here. Um, I'm going to move to a question. This is from Rebecca. Uh, I was so impressed by both teams, but from my work in HEP, higher education in prison, I know how difficult it is for incarcerated students to access information. Maine DOC team, how did you manage the research for this debate? So that is an excellent question. And I am just now realizing that in my thank you section, I completely um, forgot to thank our coaches. Uh, John Katsoulis is on the uh, the Zoom here. Uh, we also have Mr. Adam Lee. Uh, they, they were both instrumental in, in giving us a good foundation to start with. Um, Maine DOC does give us access to technology. We, we have computers we can do our own research with. Um, so we were able to supplement the foundation that our coaches gave us, but um, really is it was a team effort. Um, you know, everyone here contributed something with, to our research, whether they spoke on it or not. Um, one of our alternates is here, Anita Volpe. She did a, a tremendous job helping us as well. Um, and again, it, it was it wasn't just us; it was our coaches as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you. All right, um, this question is for Daniel. How can people support the debate league further? Well, that's an easy one. Um, we need resources. So when we're talking about a national prison debate league, we've even had conversations, tentative conversations with some international partners potentially. So it really comes down to, uh, to expand properly. We need resources because we're gonna to need to train more volunteers across the different state and uh, hopefully the federal system for both men, uh, men and women. And obviously our collegiate partners, as Jared Atchison addressed, being able to have colleges that are willing to work, especially regionally in their respective states. So we hope that we're able to start organizing those sort of events and we just need resources. We're currently a program that's partnering with the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison because they have the nonprofit status and Ved Price and Lauren Reed um, thanks to their visionary leadership, believe in our programming. And obviously everyone here today can see the proof of concept. So we hope that we can get some funders that will help um, actually fuel the effort. And without that, I mean, it's, it's a slower build. So we're hoping that um, we can get some donations, obviously, financially. And beyond that, you know, we want to offer our programming free to all incarcerated people. So it's just an issue of being able to have the the uh, resources we need to expand properly and be as effective as possible in offering this programming. Other than that, it's just the willingness. So 
we have the resources and we have the people that are willing to participate. We will put them together and continue to offer displays like you saw here today. And to follow up on that, uh, we are, I've been working with Daniel and our goal is to help him stand this project up. We told him we would open the door because um, he went, you know, we have this status of the nonprofit and our goal is to um, eventually, if possible, bring the National Prison Debate League um, under the umbrella as a project of ours and have Daniel run that. So if all things pan out well, that is the intended goal. And, you know, we look forward to supporting Daniel and his work. As you can see, he put this together in three months. He's been home after doing almost 19 years. So imagine what this person can do with resources um, and a support system. And so that's what we're that's what we're intending to do. And I'm on the ground fighting for you, Daniel. And um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to make it happen. And I I have nothing but um, confidence that we can. So that's also right. a follow up on that question. Um, next question here. This is a good one. Um, from Peter, I'm curious as to the education and backgrounds of the participants for both Maine DOC and MIT. You'd be surprised. I heard these and this was great. So if uh, both parties want to share the educational backgrounds, uh, that'd be awesome. You don't all have to speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Hi, Victoria Scott. Um, I am currently in the third year of my bachelor's. I am a pre-law concentrated justice studies student minoring in psychology, but I'm hoping to make a transition into a self-designed interdisciplinary degree program for soft infrastructural social engineering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Daniel Porter. I'm a graduate student through the University of Maine Orono. I'm in a program called Peace and Reconciliation Studies. Um, basically, my focus is going to be restorative justice. It's got that kind of a lean towards it. They didn't offer that specific degree, so I took an interdisciplinary degree to get to where I want to go. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Chandler Dougal. Um, I'm working on a master's degree in public administration from Penn State. Um, along with a graduate certificate in Homeland Security Studies. Uh, and I'm also taking a paralegal studies certification program through the University of Maine at Augusta, and I'm currently applying to law school. Hello, uh, Sean Livy. I got my bachelor's degree through the University of Maine at Augusta. Uh, somebody mentioned it earlier, the Sunshine Lady Foundation. That's where that's who did the whole college program at the Maine State Prison. The incredible Doris Buffett, who I thank every chance I get for literally changing my life. And I am now currently enrolled in a master's degree program in youth development at Michigan State. Hi, um, I'm a second year college student in um, Washington Community College for my business degree. And I currently got my entrepreneurship certificate and I should be graduating within a semester for business, business management. I said Tatiana Thompson. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a BA from Smith College from years and years ago and a Juris Doctor degree. Um, so I. That's okay. Anita. Uh, and then I guess we're up next. So hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a third year undergrad studying mechanical engineering. I'm Matilda. I am a second year undergrad studying biological engineering and mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm Santi. I'm also <clears throat> a third year student studying economics and I'm also doing a concentration in philosophy. Uh, I'm Carl. I have a bachelor's degree from Vassar College in math and stats. And I'm currently a master's student uh, in finance and engineering at, at MIT. And hi, I'm Luca. I'm currently a third year undergrad studying political science and math. So as you can see, as you can see, uh, debate doesn't it spans from multiple backgrounds and it has applications in all sectors and all parts of your life. So. That's kind of what we want to also emphasize here is that's not just for specific um, walks of life. Here's a um, question coming in from 
Let's see. The, okay, so we have ABCF um, students. So this is a correctional facility and we got to um, have an open dialogue with them last night with Ruthie Gilmore. They are awesome. Um, when I was on the debate team in high school many years ago, all arguments had to be fact-based with sources mentioned and not emotionally based without references. I saw main DOC with reference source cards and quotes for all points, but I did not see one fact-based source supported arguments from MIT. Have the standards for professional for, for professional debate changed? I'm realizing we may have been slightly unclear with our citations. We were working, I believe from the same evidence document that the main DOC team was working from. So we were citing that document. I, maybe we just weren't doing it in a clear way, but we did have quotes um, and like the names and the years of all the authors in there. Yeah, in addition, um, at least like for the specific type of like debate that we do on like a college level, there is in fact actually like, and this is just specific to the standard that we do, there is a notion of, we are actually in the debate that we usually do not allow to use evidence. So as a result, like a lot of like the traditional forms of debate that we do on the college level ends up being very much based on like reasoning and on like just pure analysis. So I think probably a lot of that ends up bleeding just from like our specific debate backgrounds as well. Yeah, yeah I'd like to say something is different from parliamentary debate, but Daniel, yeah, to this format. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I just wanted, in all fairness to MIT, first of all, um, our formatting is different. They, are, they're, they do parliamentary debate and they adopted the NPDL formatting because what's different from standard collegiate debate is that we allow for that five on five team debate with, di you know, again, different formatting that's designed to be what you just saw. So they made the modifications to uh, adapt our formatting and uh, they certainly made plenty of verbal evidence citations. So I, I just applaud them for being adaptable and still uh, bringing the heat that they brought. So um, certainly no, uh, no lapses there in, for, in terms of the way they presented their evidence is just, came across differently. Yeah, that's a good answer there. Um, this question is coming from Deborah, and it is for MIT. What were your thoughts and feelings about participating in this event? Have any of your assumptions been challenged or changed? And I can say I've had, a, I've had brief time to prep with and talk with the MIT debate team, and they've been extremely pleasant and um, very thankful for this opportunity. All of them are very gracious and nice people. So just wanna say that as well, but yeah, to the MIT people. Um. Uh, so initially going into the event, uh, when we had our briefings uh, with Daniel and also with Ben, uh, I think they were like really descriptive on how the MDOC team has been like working really well and um, that they're a very impressive team. So going in, we were already like a little bit intimidated and we were like, this is going to be a hard debate. And I think that um, based on the debate, y'all definitely lived up to that expectation. Uh, so it was a really cool experience in my opinion. All right, this question, we have one here. Um, There's a lot of questions. This is great. I'm happy to see this level of engagement. Um, and we'll carry on with questions for about 10 more minutes. Um, so this is coming from Maine MSP Education. I'm assuming this is Maine State Prison. For MIT, um, Santi, how do you factor and or did you consider Franklin Roosevelt's packing of the court to force through the New Deal into your argument surrounding the lack of perceived threats to the current court's validity forward slash stability. How does this tie into today's current discussion and demands of further expansion of the court in today's political landscape? Big question. Don't feel obligated to have to go all the way with that. That's a big question, but yeah, so I guess like with, for instance, with relation to a lot of the arguments that we had made, one of the initial things that comes to mind is that, for instance, back in FDR's time, one of the big reasons why he decided to pack the courts was in large part because, A, he felt that it was very much stacked against his favor and was like really limiting on him. 
but also B, that he felt that there was so much power within the court itself to be able to shape both the outcomes of what he could do and what like the legislative branch could do. So I feel as that with a lot of these discussions also happening nowadays within our political climate of different people on either side talking about potentially impacting the courts, I think a lot of that definitely does speak to the reverence and the power that the court currently holds within our political climate, both in the sense of how we want to protect it and uphold its integrity, and also in the sense of we want to make sure that we're still able to manage our government in a way without it being seen as like a burden. I think there's a lot of different grounds for both sides there. That's a solid answer. And I actually liked when you uh, came up to the podium as well. I like that passion. So always bring that. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is from um, the Correctional Facility students. We have, um, I went to nationals in high school. Um, and let's see. Um, Main DOC rebutted fantastic use of research note cards. I respect the craft. Do any of you in the main DOC have previous debate experience? Absolutely not. <laughs> First time for everything. I took one debate class about six years ago, and I think that kind of leads off the experience that we have for uh, debating on this team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being incarcerated is a rather um, continuous debate class. <laughs> I can attest. So I, we may have had a, a bit of an unfair advantage as far as that. Experiential <laughs> knowledge. All right. This question is from Aaron. For Sean Libby, this is Aaron Kinzel, and we grew up together in prison in the 90s. I've changed my life and become a professor at the University of Michigan and an admin at Ashland University working with reentry for prison education. Sean, how do you think access to education has changed you since the 90s? And what do you want to do as a career post-prison? Uh, well, hello, Aaron. Uh, I actually, I, I knew that you were, yeah, some of the stuff, because I've actually followed some of the stuff you've done. So I'm, I'm really, I've been really happy to see uh, what you've done and what you've accomplished as far as how it's, it's literally an education has changed my life. Like I, I, I remember when I first enrolled in the college program at, at MSP and the, the coordinator brought me into a room and just like, could, you could see she was second guessing the whole thing. And she had my high school transcripts where I graduated with like a 1.7 or something like that <laughs> GPA. Um, I never took a school seriously. It was never a thing. Um, I got into school just to kind of get my mind working in prison and it just, it, it like literally changed my life. It, uh, somebody like the, I mentioned Doris Buffett earlier. I do it every chance I get because she's the most amazing person that did so many things for so many people across this country that most people don't even know about, um, including paying for so many different people's college, but having somebody like her put their faith in you and forget the money. Like she, she, the faith that she puts in you and her belief that you could do this was really life-changing. Um, as far as uh, what I've been focusing a, a lot on is I, I've, I'm, I've been incarcerated for almost 25 years since I was 18 years old. Um, so I really want to focus all my time. That's why I'm getting my degree in youth development. I want to focus my time and efforts uh, helping young people like I was. I got in trouble as a teenager. So I really want to focus my time and effort uh, working with young people and trying to help them avoid the same predicament that we're all in right here. I've been lucky enough to, uh, to be able to work some with some of the youth at the Youth Development Center here in the state. I was asked to talk to high school students uh, earlier this year. Um, it's just something that I really want to focus my time and effort on because, you know, it's one of the cliche things you hear. But if you can stop one kid from ending up in a place like this, you, you, you've done something. So uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I really uh I'm proud of everything you're doing and thank you. I'll also, Sean Pika said some good things about you as well, Sean uh, Libby. So just so you know, I'm over at Hudson Link. So um, next question here, this comes from Jeff Cox. Um, MIT, what expectations and perceptions did you come into this experience of debating residents in a carceral setting? And how were these expectations shattered or upheld? 
were sent one article about the National Prison Debate League um, at some point in our email chain. So like, I, I'd never heard of it before. So the only background I had was like this one article someone sent us. Um, and in the article, at the very end, it mentions the record of the teams from the NPDL as opposed to college teams. And it's something like 1,200 to five. Like, it is an absolutely insane record. And I read it and I sat there, I was like, why are we doing this if we know they're gonna win? <laughs> and I was, and the rest of my team's like preparing really hard. And I'm, think, I'm sitting there thinking like, we don't have a chance. Like, what's the plan here? And, but we did it. And I thought like, at the very least, we'll learn something about how to be better debaters because they clearly are on like another level here. So, and they, they definitely lived up to that. It was actually like, on the like college circuit, we see a lot of teams with a very similar skill level to our own, like a lot of like middling records. We like end up seeing like very similar things. People say similar things, but we're saying it, it all feels very, like it's fairly similar throughout the whole circuit. So it was really interesting to just like come into contact with a team that really is like so far beyond us. Yeah, that's... And I, I just want to say this, and I can say this, I guess, because I've done time, is that you won't see a more organic learning setting than people who are incarcerated. I'll tell you what, there's nobody on cell phones in class, nobody's skipping class, everybody's engaged, and nobody will read a book and offer the level of analysis as students who are incarcerated. You dig into material like our life depends on it, because a lot of times it does. And so um, kudos again to Maine for this level of preparation and representing the field and representing what education means for us and, um, you know, and break and shattering, you know, these narratives around um, competencies and abilities just blew it out the water. And that's what the Alliance is going to continue to um, highlight is, is this level of talent that, um, that exists in these spaces and the level of humanity that exists in these spaces as well. So thank you there. I uh, will take one more question. One more question, and we'll take it a lot. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. This is a good one coming from Amanda Novak. I'd be interested in hearing everyone's career goals. So that'll be the last question, and it's long. It's a long answer on purpose. So we'll leave that. And um, I'm interested in hearing this as well. So maybe we can kick it off with uh, MIT, and then we'll let Maine wrap it up. Sounds good. Um, as for my career goals, I'm hoping after undergrad to go into industry for mechanical engineering and hopefully for medical devices, because I think it's a really important field. I'm looking to get a grad degree and maybe a PhD, and I hope to work in a lab specifically working on medical devices and or different like therapeutics for cancer. Uh, personally, I'm looking to go either into graduate school for economics or into industry, particularly either in research or in consulting, in large part because I think researching and being able to analyze like a lot of debate allows you to do is like a very important and crucial part of like who I am and what I love. Uh, I'm thinking about getting to the industry after finishing my graduate degree in most likely quantitative finance. So like designing financial products and pricing them at a fair price for people to have their together. Uh, I'm keeping everything open, but probably leaning towards a PhD in political science, but that's still far away. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, well, the camera focused in oddly, but, um, <laughs> but um, so I'm not sure that I'm actually capable of doing any one thing. So while I was serving time at the Maine State Prison, I worked in the education department and developed and implemented a couple of new classes up there and, caught, and sort of caught the bug of teaching. Um, as we all know, that doesn't necessarily pay the bills. So I, I've been working with a professor over the last year or so trying to develop classes specifically augmented towards incarcerated people and classes developed for um, restorative justice and that sort of thing for people that, that are not incarcerated. 
but I, I have a kind of bucket list item to end up teaching one or two of those classes, but I think the main focus of my work is probably going to be through a group such as Restorative Justice of Maine and just seeing how I can try to give back to a community that I, you know, played a part in doing damage to as a younger man. Thank you. Um, well, as I said in the, in the answer to a question earlier, um, I'm planning on attending law school. Um, I'll be releasing next summer, so I'm hoping to start law school next fall, and I'd like to um, practice in either constitutional law or criminal defense, which I'm sure doesn't surprise that many people. So um, thank you again for everyone for being here and watching. I kind of already said what I want to do. I want to work with uh, young people. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say ditch digging, but <laughs> I decided not to. Yeah, I just, that's what that's going to be my main focus is <laughs> working with young people and just trying to like kind of like Dan said. It's and, and I think a lot of people would be surprised that there's a lot of that, and and I know in our DOC, and I'm sure it's the same in, in DOCs all across the country that there's a lot of wanting to give back to the community that you somehow did harm to. And that's my main goal, especially doing that with young people. So. Hey, Victoria. You got a standoff going on there? <laughs> I mean, right. we got to stand up. All right. I'm going to talk. <laughs> Um, I'm not quite sure where this road will lead, but I am very interested in the design and administration of synergistic social systems. So perhaps if I can get past my shyness more fully, then uh, you'll see me run for office someday. Tell you guys right now, mine's is not as shiny as theirs. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I'm in um, college for business management. So I get released in about six to seven months. And my goal is to open my own clothing business. And if that's successful, I want to design my own sneakers. Okay. Thank you. In case you haven't realized, I'm a lot older than everyone here, um, everywhere in on both teams. And so I'm retired. And uh, that's, so, <laughs> I put a lot of years into practicing law. Thanks. He was our ringer. <laughs> With that, I think we can conclude. Um, thank you to the judges. Thank you for all the participants, the panelists. Thank you to Maine DOC. And thank you to Daniel Troop for being able to pull something like this off that fast with no resources. So um, we hope to get you some resources, Daniel, and I'm gonna do my best to do so. Thank so um, with that, we can conclude. We hope to follow up with everybody here and I hope you all had a great time and had a great experience. And um, we hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Feel free to reach out to the Alliance or Daniel with any questions or any follow-ups. We'd be more than happy to have a conversation with anybody here in attendance and beyond, so. Daniel, can we send you stamps? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you Most some, people. Sean. Most people don't get some, but I know Daniel. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.